thank you very much, Chris. And uh, thanks for the invite to come to speak to you about what we're doing uh, on the other side of the border in Ontario. Um, and I appreciate having an hour to talk at the, that workshop where I, th I think we had 15 minutes, wasn't nearly enough to cover a lot of information. Um, but uh, let me show this works here. I am going to cover a lot of information. So for those of you that aren't familiar with about Phragmites at all, for those of you who are, I apologize in advance. I am going to talk about the plant because I think it's important to know what we're dealing with so we can deal with it better, what the concerns are with the plant itself, what our control options are, and the challenges that we face dealing with, with uh, Phragmites despite the, um, some of the tools that we have. And I'm going to highlight some um, initiatives that are ongoing in Ontario. And then uh, what I feel are components of having a really effective control program. So first of all, we're dealing with uh, Phragmites australis. We do have native Phragmites on the landscape. We know this from uh, genetic work from Kristen Saltonstall at Yale University. We have this haplotype M that's come from Europe. She traced it back there. And uh, back in the early 2000s, a scientist with Agriculture Agri-Food Canada recognized it as Canada's worst invasive plant. I'm going to have a lot of Canadian flavor to this. I'm going to try not to say A, but, uh, <laughs> um, and, and you, you see it everywhere. This is a Sports Illustrated uh, picture, a young LeBron James. He's, yeah, I think he grew up in Cleveland, so there he is standing in Farag for some reason without his shirt. Um, this, is it. this is our native Phragmites. It uh, quote unquote tends to behave itself. It grows in amongst our other native plants. Um, it's not an issue. This is invasive Phragmites when it's first getting started, and this is the best time to deal with it, but it's the hardest time to get people to pay attention um, because they don't understand that in a few years it's going to look like this. Uh, and it can grow, as you know, really tall and in, in nutrient and rich environments like this was an agricultural watershed. Uh, it, it can really create a lot of uh, biomass. This picture actually, one of, one of these pictures was the first project I worked on with herbicide use in a wetland. It, it's ended up in the uh, Natural Museum of History in, in New York. It's kind of cool. Um, it's perennial grass. And if you go over to Europe, where it's a native species, there have been uh, cells there for well over uh, 1,000 years. Like it just, once it's there, it's there, unless humans have taken it out. It has a number of mechanisms for spreading. And once, once any of these viable parts land on moist, exposed sediment, um, it can get established. So here's one of those feathery seed heads we see this time of year. Someone's done a count about 2,000 seeds. If, if the cell is uh, genetically um, isolated, the viability of these seeds is really quite low, like maybe 1%. Um, if they're, if they're uh, cross-pollinated, it can get up to about 40%. But one of these seedlings, if it happens to germinate, it can actually produce a lot of ramets in a growing season, like up to 80, like in pre uh, premier condition, like uh, greenhouse conditions. This is from uh, a student at uh, University of Waterloo found this out. So you only have one seedling just to get, get established somewhere to, to, to make it go. Along our lake shores or our creeks and rivers where there's a lot of wave energy breaking up the, the uh, Phragmites parts in the growing season, you see a lot of the... Um, viable plant parts will get redistributed along the lake. That's what's so hard to get it off the lakes once it's on there. And here's, here's an example of just one of those little stalks, and there it is starting to sprout. If the stalks fall in the water, they can start sprouting at the nodes. And this one, this, <laughs> I found this out, I was just so despondent. So this was standing dead stuff from the, the winter. The ice had ripped it all out, and then the waves had washed it in on shore. So this is in this early spring. And you think it's dead, it's like a, it's like a zombie plant. Uh, you, you think it's all dead and there's still some viable plant parts there remaining. So if they get in the right conditions, they can re-sprout. So those, what we see along the roads, those, those standing dead cane, they may not all be dead. Um, and it's what's happening below ground uh, that makes it such an invasive plant. There's a lot of biomass, that the, far more than you see above is, hap is growing below ground. So can produce a lot of biomass above ground. And, and the below ground uh, roots and stalks, they can go, uh, uh, rhizomes, they can go really deep to get nutrients and water that they need. And so basically once the below ground uh, biomass is established, that's when you see this exponential growth. So that's why you'll see in a few years, a few sprigs here and there, and then you come back in a couple years, uh, two, three years, and it's just pop up. That's why it's uh, things happening below ground that we're not, we're not able to see. So here's just a side profile 
of, of um, a well-established phragmite cell below ground. And that's what we're trying to kill, you know, when we're doing these mechanical methods or chemical methods, trying to get all that stuff dead. And the exponential growth uh, from one parent stalk, this is kind of how it happens. I've seen these coming off in different directions. So this is stolen. This is what you can see that's happening above ground. Uh, so one, one of the parent stalks is back in here amongst the native plants. And it's sending out these, these long uh, stolons. And sometimes this happens, most times this happens below ground. So you just see a stalk here and there. And uh, they can get quite long. This is still August, so it's still going. And, it, and they come off in different directions. So every single parent stalk is doing this. And the plant um, can survive a lot of different habitat conditions. Uh, brackish water is why it does well on the, on the roads. Even if we have a harsh winter, lots of road salt being put on. Uh, variable water depths doesn't seem to matter. Low high nutrient sites doesn't seem to matter. Although you see with higher nutrient sites, you get a lot more of the, the height and density. Variable pH, I was reading a paper where it was growing in acid mine tailing pH of two. And basically the plant, this particular um, variety is found every continent in the world except the Antarctic. So here's one of the strategies it has for surviving the deeper water depths. As the lake levels rise or the, the pond levels rise, it sends out these adventitious shoots. And then it just gets the water through the, or the oxygen through the water column. Or it can just send them across the water. This is about two meter deep water depth, so it doesn't seem to matter. And then the other extreme where it can grow in really dry conditions, and it just sends the roots down to get the, the water and nutrients. It's a really strong competitor for the nutrients. I have yet to see any of our native plants that will compete that plant, and that includes the cattail, willow, button bush. It'll just, once it gets established, it just takes over. There's some evidence that it's aleopathic as well. It may send out some chemicals to kill the roots of native plants. And basically, there's no checks and balances in the system. It doesn't belong here. So humans have to do the control. Because if we leave it to Mother Nature, it's just going to go. Uh, I thought I would uh, keep this map in because it kind of does have relevance for where we are today. This is a work done by Paul Catling and Giselle Matro. They visited herbariums all across Canada, and they went to try and track the spread of invasive phragmites through the country. So what they found is the, the early 1900s in Nova Scotia, and by 1910, along the St. Lawrence, Quebec, and Montreal, the first known specimens in Ontario were Lake St. Clair. Uh, Walpole Island. So probably in this area here, it's been here at least 80 years. That's why it's so bad down here um, in southern Ontario and also um, just on this side of the lake as well. It's been here a long time. Uh, and then in the uh, next few uh, decades, it spread locally in these areas. And then the 1990s, it really took off. And there was a lot of papers, a lot of interest in the, in the U.S., this side of the border. A lot of scientists recognizing, noticing there was something going on with Phragmites. And at that time, we weren't 100% sure we were dealing with an invasive strain. Um, by the end of the paper, uh, their, their research, they show it going up into northern Ontario and heading west. And then what they did was uh, extrapolation based on climate change scenarios where they expected it to, to be able to go. And this is actually very conservative because we know now that it's further north. It's up in here right now along some of the major highways. Um, Miles Falk with the uh, Great Lakes Indian uh, Fish and Wildlife um, Commission, he, he put this map together a couple of years ago for the Great Lakes Spring Mice Collaborative. And you can see the distribution across the Great Lakes. Like it's, it's a disaster. And I was really happy for the first time the IJC's report on the status of the Great Lakes mentioned Phragmites as a threat. So that's, uh, we're starting to get a lot more uh, awareness of, of the impact of Phragmites for sure. So the spread, I mentioned in the 90s, there was a lot of interest. So a lot of papers came out about why Phragmites were spreading around. A lot of human disturbance on the landscape, lots of construction, um, urbanization, a lot more nutrients into their water courses, and, and certainly the pulses in our, our natural uh, creeks and streams have changed dramatically from all of the paving. But a really neat paper came out of Quebec. It showed a direct link to the spread of Phragmites through Quebec and the development of transportation corridors, so roads and rail, railways. And um, Karen Alexander, uh, she worked for the Lake Huron Center for Coastal Conservation. Her job was to map Phragmites along the Lake Huron shoreline from Sarnia all the way over to Wyerton. And whenever she found a new cell starting on the shoreline, 
If she was to go up into the watershed, it was invariably going along a roadside ditch or an agricultural ditch. So that's how it was getting down to the lake shore. And this is basically how it's been spread around. Construction crews go in, they do the work along the roadside, they load up the equipment, put on the flatbed truck, and go to the next job site. They don't clean the equipment. So all those viable plant parts are stuck there. And I, I used to um, accuse our Ontario Ministry of Transportation of spreading the frag because wherever there's new construction, the next year the frag muddies would be coming in. It wasn't from that, it was from, from this type of activity. And so it's not, I mean, coming here today, there's like well, not too many roads you don't see frag muddies on anymore. This has been controlled actually. This is where I live, um, just north of uh, Lake Erie. This is what really bothers me when I go further north, and probably for you folks, when you go up to cottage country or northern Michigan and you start seeing it along the roads up in those areas, um, you know where it's going to go. It's going to go back into those wetlands and on those creeks, and it's going to flow into these areas and get established, right? And for me, those are, those are easy, easy fixes. Just get it off the road. Um, and we're starting to find more of an issue in agricultural drainage ditches, and I suspect you may have that same issue here. The farmers are, are getting the, their lands flooded longer. They can't get in and, and plant the crops because the frag is plugging the, the drains. Um, so here's another example down where I live. Um, and there's a lot of egg drains that have frag in them now, and, and some of them are quite large. This is in Sarnia. This has actually been controlled now. This is another way it's been spreading around, ATV use. This is particularly noticeable when the Great Lakes were low uh, back in 2010 and 11. If I, would, I do a lot of wet, uh, wetland work, coastal wetland work, and the amount of ATV tracks through these systems was just, I just wanted to cry. This is a globally rare ecosystem on uh, Lake Huron, really rare uh, plants and animals in here, and there were ATV tracks all through this. No one's really looking after this place. And so they, they would come through the frag and then they they take it all the way in. This is this wetland system goes about two kilometers in off the shoreline. And you could see right along the ATV tracks where the, the frag maze was being taken into the interior of the wetland system. And I've heard of other folks that go into these uh, backwater areas, little ponds, and the only way in and out is an ATV trail. And there's frag muddies around around these small lakes in that. So we have a a really invasive plant, what are the concerns? There are a lot for humans where it's well established. Lots of recreation opportunities. You can't access the lake, you can't see the lake, you can't see the sun, sunset. Property values decline. People are paying really high taxes for having a lake, lake shore uh, property and they can't even recreate on the lake or see, see the sun or the, or the lake. Damage to infrastructure, this one gets a lot of uptick. Um, through a fire under hydro corridors uh, or power lines and um, block, blocked inter intersections. And so uh, this, this picture here actually, Murray Purcell, he's just retired. He was at the Ontario Ministry of Transportation in the West Region, so he would be working in the Windsor area and all the way up to Tobermory. He took this picture to his managers and he said, you know, this is what we need, this is why we need to deal with it along the roads. And, and so now we have uh, policies being put in place to deal with across the province because of the damage to infrastructure. There's a community in southern Ontario, um, St. Thomas, city of St. Thomas, the residents had a very similar situation to this one here. High-end homes, frag money is around uh, an inland lake. The lake was owned by the city and they went to the city and they said, if you don't get rid of that frag and there's a fire, we're gonna sue. <laughs> so at first they were, they were the, doing this and then they formed a committee, they worked together and they, they have had a plan for the whole city. I helped them develop one section of it, like a, on a, a sub-watershed, and then they just took it and ran with it. Private citizens working with city staff, and they just became frag-free in 2019. So it was a pretty exciting uh, project. But that's, that's the threat they use, the liability threat. Golf courses, trying to educate folks that are managing these. They have tools in place to deal with frag muddies and they're like just kind of leaving it and they don't understand the impact. Uh, pretty, you know, threat, fire threats, but you know, that's no big deal on a fire uh, or a golf course, but it's a, it's a spread vector as well. So we need everybody getting it off their properties. As a wetland ecologist, this is why I'm most concerned about it. The impact to our wildlife. The wildlife will use the edges of the frag. But you get into the interior of these sites, and I call them dead zones. I don't find any tracks or scat or nests, not, no sign that wildlife can utilize 
um, the habitat uh, within the middle of these large frag uh, cells. And, and a lot of inf information now is coming out in the impact of our really rare species, the ones that absolutely have to have wetland habitat to survive. That's why there's species at risk. Major, major impacts on the wetlands themselves. Um, they can dry them out. Over in Europe, where you've had phragmites growing a long, long time, they eventually will evolve into a thicket just because of the buildup of the biomass. So they actually go in and cut out the biomass in some of these areas to restore them so that they, they don't have that to keep them a wetland. Nutrient cycling changes, and, and basically the diversity of our native plants just drops off substantially. So this is what we're losing. This is a metal, coastal metal marsh on Lake Huron. Lots of diversity in there. You can see a little bit of the purple loosestrife, but it's starting to behave itself. We have that purple loosestrife uh, uh, beetle uh, release program. It's working awesome. And right beside it, there's that wall of phragmites coming in. And when we do uh, phragmites control work in some of these areas, we, f we do find dead turtles. The blandings are particularly susceptible because uh, just the way the shell is, they have to expend a lot of energy to try and pull themselves through that thick uh, standing um, cane, and they'll eventually uh, just run out of energy and food and water and, and die. Um, some neat studies uh, coming out as well on, on the north shore of Lake Huron. The one on, on the uh, left here, uh, Ryan Bolton, he was looking at uh, parasites in, in turtle egg nests, and he put in uh, temperature loggers and humidity loggers in the nests, and over the course of the summer, the Phragmites grew over some of those nests, and the viability of those eggs was extremely low. And when he looked at the data, the temperature dropped because of the shading effect, and, and they just dried out. The, the, um, the moisture um, levels dropped dramatically. But that's just something he found from pure serendipity, just looking at something else. Um, the Fowler stoves, I don't know if you have them here, but on the lake, the northern side of Lake Erie, there's only a few locations where these toads exist. And Long Point was one of them. And at one point, uh, they had uh, the most viable population in all of Canada. And uh, David Green, um, he's been studying these species for years and years and years. So he has a long-term data set and showed the increase in Phragmites and, and the dramatic decline in, in the Fowler's toads. A uh, really cool paper uh, just came out recently. This is from University of Waterloo, uh, Rebecca Rooney's lab, uh, Courtney Robichaud. She's just looking at the, the birds in the wet coastal wetlands. And what she found that the, a lot of the aerial uh, foragers, um, a lot less over Phragmites compared to even, even in the invasive cattail areas. And when she looked closer at the inverts, it's really, really neat, neat findings here. So she, what she found was that with the bugs that were being hatched over top of uh, the system was, was very dramatically different. So this is the Phragmites uh, wetland system here. Um, much, much fewer insects being hatched out. This was a site here that they had treated with a herbicide the year before, um, the highest number of insects. And then compared to the meadow marsh and the cattail emergent marsh. And the other interesting thing that she found was um, the insects that hatched, there was more of them coming off of the the wetland system where they had sprayed the, the frag the year before and then they had gotten rid of it, burning it. Um, but the ones that in the natural systems were a lot bigger. So anyways, a, a bit of a difference there in, in the size. Um, but anyway, really interesting result. The, the bottom line is that Phragmites is certainly impacting the, these species. And the, the treatment using a herbicide in these systems doesn't appear to affect the, the inverts. I'm going to talk a bit about the control um, methods that are available. And my mom was like, uh, I mentioned the wildlife will use the edges. So anyone says to you, it doesn't matter, like frag's not home to anything, that they're not, they're not accurate on that. The birds will nest in them. I've seen the red winged blackbirds, marsh wrens, leaf bittern. They'll nest, they'll use the structure there. So if you want to do any work, it's best to get rid of that structure this time of year so there's nothing there for the nest to get set up. So there's a timing aspect to going and doing this work, particularly in areas where I work in the, in the wetland systems where you have a lot of species that are relying on a little bit of habitat that's left, left for them. And so, and the other thing too is like, 
You have to have a goal. Like, is it total eradication or is it dampening down so you can, you can control it, manage it, control it? Um, and and that's, that's just a matter of uh, the size of the area that you're dealing with, how bad it is, how much um, um, community involvement you have. But you have to have a, that goal set in mind of where, you, where you're going to go with this. And then what's the most appropriate methods to use on that site? I would say it's site specific. It's not like black and white. This is going to work here. It's going to work here. You have to know your system. Um, what's the best time to go in? Some, some sites you can go in a lot earlier. There's not, no habitat. Other sites you shouldn't even be mucking around until well, well into the growing season. And, and then how do you actually know that what you're doing is working? A lot of people just go do control work. They don't actually monitor to see what's going on and if they're getting the results they want. So that's my model. Do the most good with the least harm. And yeah, the snakes will use the edges of the frag too. Right at eye level. Um, Biological control, uh, how many of you are familiar with this program that's going on now? So this Burnt Blossy, Cornell University, uh, him and his colleagues are the ones that, that uh, developed the Purple Loose Strife Beetle release campaign. It's been really successful. So what they, they've been at this for more than a decade. So they went over to Europe and said, okay, what's feeding on frag over there in its natural environment? They identified all these, these species, and they came back to the eastern seaboard Atlantic. Um, side and, and so okay what's in the frag here on state side and and so they narrowed it down to 26 different species and almost all of them weren't native they'd come across uh, with the invasives and, and so they they narrowed it down to two moths so basically they have to do all these studies okay what could these moths potentially also impact if we were to release them out into the environment and of course they can't differentiate between invasive frag and native frag so if there's been these conversations around, okay, do we let the genie out of the bottle anyway? And a lot of people say, look, our native frag's going. Like the invasive frag's out competing it. Um, so a lot of land managers want, want this tool. If you want to know more about, um, there's um, a <coughs> webinar by Burnt on the Great Lakes for Mice Collaborative. Um, he talks about that. I think it's almost, almost um, ready for approval. And I had mentioned earlier in my talk about um, the frag in Europe where all the natural checks and balances are in place, it's still a problem over there. They have all those insects that will feed on it and it still grows monoculture. So I hope that um, the moths will help, but I'm not as convinced that it'll work as well as the purple loose strife beetle has worked. This is a different plant. Um, I hope I'm wrong. So people are trying everything. Goats, this was in the paper a few years ago. I had so many calls. I was just going to use goats. I think, you know what, for certain areas, maybe, this was a um, land um, reclamation site. It used to be a landfill. It wasn't really high habitat anyway. But they wanted to try something else. For a lot of our systems, it's, not, it's just not environmentally responsible to be taking in goats to, to munch on uh, on the Phragmites, and, and once they see uh, other plants, they're going to eat them too. So it would, it's great though for a public education piece. If you've got some frag in an urban area, you want to put some goats in there and put a sign up to educate folks about frag. Um, but other than that, I, I don't really think as a viable option it stands up. And um, but someone said to me, okay, what if we can spray the frag with something that will make it palatable to our, our uh, herbivores, like something like a salad dressing? And I said, oh, that's an awesome idea. <laughs> and, and maybe someone will come up with something like that. I mean, that would be really cool if, if, you know, the deer would start munching on frag, but they actually don't. I have seen muskrat um, munching on, and, you know, the, the more succulent shoots that come up in the early time of the year. And when they're really desperate, when they don't have cattail, they'll make their dens out of, musk, out of the frag and kind of open it up, but not nearly. You can tell they're not enjoying it. They don't open it up as much as they would in cattail. Covering it, smothering it. You think if you deprive a plant of sunlight, it would die, right? So it'll send out its uh, shoots out from around the tarp. If the tarp's not thick enough, I'll show them up through the tarp. I showed you that below ground biomass. There's a lot of stored nutrients there. So you have to keep a really thick, heavy tarp on for a long time. And this has limitations. You have an acre site, you're not going to tarp an acre site. So um, in some sites, it's smaller, it may be. Uh, a viable solution, but for the, the type of uh, areas that we're dealing with, not so much. This picture on the left is on a shoreline of Lake Huron. There's also wave action and wind action. Um, so not 
too suitable in a lot of sites. This one I'm really excited about, particularly now that the lakes are up, the cutting to drown method. So basically the, the idea is you cut that stalk as close to the sediment as you can. And um, how it works is the deeper the water, the better chance you have of killing the below ground structures. Because they have, you, if any of you have seen those rhizomes, they're pretty big. They can hold a lot of oxygen. So they'll pump up another stalk through the water column as quick as they can. But if the water's too deep and they can't get it up to get the oxygen replenished, they'll die. And so that, that's basically how it works. Very, very water depth dependent. So we've got fraggers out there in the landscape using all kinds of tools. There's spades. Uh, that, spading actually works on dry sites as well. And these awesome raspberry cane cutters. I had some fraggers up in Olifant show me this, this tool here. I brought some today if you want to buy them. Buy one. Um, and they use ice fishing sleds, and they're out there uh, harvesting the phragmites in, in, the, in the water, and it's working really well. And some bigger sites, we, we, this is when I first started uh, doing the cutting to drown method, um, using the still brush cutters with a reciprocating blade. They're not meant for water, but I have, oh, f going on five years now, you use a um, lubricant, and, and they work really well if you, if you keep them well maintained. But behind Josh, you can see that wall frag. It does have its limitations as well. But this is the first site we did. The guys cut manually with the gas cutters. All that biomass had to come out of the water because otherwise it'll sprout. But we got it cleared out. And, and uh, I had some plots through here. And, and we had um, a 90% reduction after the first cut. So that's a substantial amount of, of reduced biomass. Um, but that thick stuff, there's a lot of thick stuff. Okay, we need to bring in some heavy equipment. And over in Sweden, they have these machines called truck sores um, that will do that. So I established this uh, control center in 2017 to get some funding available to get machines over. And basically, the idea is to help folks deal with frag responsibly. Um, and I have some awesome partners. Bruce Power is a nuclear um, facility. They actually help fund me get the first machine over. Greenstream Construction, or um, um, a landscape company, uh, he, um, Steve does a lot of work for the highways, dealing with vegetation along the highways. And then the Lampson Shores Frame Ice Community Group, they're a, a group of uh, retired professionals that have taken uh, these coastal wetlands under their wing to, to restore in their whole community. So basically, provide a lot of advice and folks how to deal with Phragmites. But the program I want to talk about is, is the cutting program. So there's, there's the, one of the truck source, and it's really water depth dependent. And we have a really short operating window. So we won't start cutting until July 18th, and that's for fish spawning regulations. That allows the birds to fledge. Uh, so we're not going in and, and cutting uh, where the birds are nesting. Um, so just try and reduce our impact on the coastal wetlands. And it works really well in the, these thick, thick um, um, frag cells. And the beauty of it is not just the cutting, but it'll pick up the biomass. So we can re remove tons and tons, hundreds of tons of, of frag out of these systems. So I don't know if you can see that with the lighting in here, but that's just one site. Um, that's about five days of cutting. And um, that's been piled up on the shore. So the biomass... Removal is a big part of this. Like, how do we get rid of it? Some sites like this one, we could actually put it on the shore, and it, it can later be burned when it's dry. Uh, we have these collection barges, so we can bring them um, to the to a, a shoreline. And in some areas, the municipality, uh, in-kind support, will help unload and take it uh, to the, their uh, municipal landfills and bury it. Um, in some areas, this is up in Manitoulin Island, um, um, a group up there. They had a, a barge help because we were working like a kilometer from shore. So we filled up the barge and our, and our collection barges and then the municipality guys as in kind would unload it and take it to their landfill site. Um, some areas we actually took it to a field and spread it out and burned it. And some areas uh, we just left it. We made these, I call them uh, giant muskrat dens. And when I went back to check, the, actually the turtles will loaf on it and the birds will uh, use it. So you're, you're shrinking the amount of thick frag and you're piling it and, and actually it'll eventually just go away. Um, so that's another, another solution. Everywhere we go, the, the folks come out to help us. So this is one of the cottagers. He has his own steel cutter. He came out to help because in the thinner areas, we don't need the truck sores. It's just the thick areas. This is up in Manitoulin Island. There's a crew up there who's going to systematically clean the whole island of Phragmites. 
Raspberry cane cutter folks, these were cottagers came out to help us one day. A few of these were actually from Michigan, these guys. Um, helping pick up the strands because uh, the truck stores will pick up the thick, thick biomass that's laying in the water, but we need all the stragglers to be picked up as well. Uh, so just a lot of community engagement. And what's awesome about this is when the truck stores leave, when we leave, these folks are the ones that are going to keep it cleaned up. They're going to be going out with the raspberry cane cutters for half a day or with their neighbors and working and in, in cleaning up any regrowth that comes in and keeping it clear long term. That's the goal. Uh, these are stewardship rangers from a local conservation area with, with uh, some of the volunteers uh, groups. And I, I show this picture because um, this is what's left after. This is what it used to be like. So that's what it was. Uh, that's what it was this summer. And that's what it was when we first started. So the cutting to drown is, is working and the native plants will come back in. And that's why I really like this because you can just go selectively cut any frag regrowth among the native plants and just leave them. I'll just show you some other examples of, of where we've been cutting. This is where I showed the poor, this was a Lampton Center. It's a kids camp, church camp. And they actually put in a pool because they couldn't use the lake. This is Lake Huron. And the poor land manager had been trying for years and years to get rid of the frag, even use the tarp. So we went in with uh, the one truck, sir. We only had one the first year and cleared out a section. And they were just so excited. And then uh, this past summer, for the first time in more than a decade, the campers were able to use canoes and kayaks and whatnot. And we're, we're systematically cleaning up the shoreline. We have a second truck store last year working. This is another site up on Lake Huron. Um, this is Bruce Dale Conservation Area. Folks camp there. That's their view of Lake Huron. Um, that's their shoreline. And so when we first started in 2015, manually cutting with the stills, we were able to clear an area for them. They could, for the first time in a long, long time, see the lake and see the sunset. And they were just cheering. They were so excited. Um, and then uh, when we brought the first trucks are in in 2017, cleared a big area. And so this is what's left to clean up just these uh, little pieces of growth. And this is what it used to look like there. That's that same viewpoint looking back. That's what we have now. And that's the whole embayment has been cleared out with the truck stores and, 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 and the, uh, the locals helping to clear it. Yeah. Was a lot of that happening then in concert with the Great Lakes Water Levels coming up? Totally. Yeah, that's, that's, that's it in a nutshell. That's why I like, we have to get as much of this done as we can. Because once the lake starts to drop, it, it doesn't work in, in the water that's a little bit lower than your knee for the most part. You want it, you want it about 40 centimeters or deeper. Um, in the really shallow water, it, you know, you're just going to be stressing it a little bit. So yeah, water depths are critical. Yeah. But you know, there's some sites, the cutting the drown is not going to work for that reason. The water depths aren't sufficient and it's just too massive. So. Um, I know there's a lot of talk about uh, chemical use, when, when's appropriate to use chemicals. I know there's been a lot of work in the states using chemicals um, and a lot of money invested. Uh, this is from uh, Heather Braun when she was with the Great Lakes Commission. And as Chris mentioned, in Canada, we don't have those chemicals available to us. We have uh, three products. Two are glyphosate based, WeatherMax, VisionMax, and they have the surfactant in them, so you can't use them over water, you shouldn't use them over water. In our solar power line, that's the Amazapure product. Um, and uh, you have to have a special permit from the government to use these products in, in natural areas. And it's a letter of opinion, it's called, so they know you have a good game plan. Whoever's using the chemicals knows what the heck they're doing. And we are using herbicides in some areas. Um, and we apply it a site appropriately. This is a windy shoreline with uh, hand mitts or backpack sprayers walking through. Um, targeting plants. Some of the contractors have the industrial vehicles. Nature Conservancy of Canada, Bar a Marsh Master, as far as I know, was the first one ever in Ontario. And then a contractor, Eric Giles, bought another one. This is all down a long point to use them there. And then, you know, what do you do with the biomass? We, we have found this is the first project I was involved with using herbicides. Um, and we, you know, get rid of the biomass and, and you get a really nice response. So this is on Lake Caram where the lake levels are low. The site was sprayed and rolled and burned, and all the native plants came in. And there was my frustration. We're not using the right herbicide. Like we, WeatherMax is not the right herbicide to be using. We're using it because we 
It's the only one we have. But if I had available the glyph just glyphosate, I could put a water-friendly surfactant. This, this would have been cleaned up. We would have been done. And um, you know, the native plants are coming in, the, the insects and wildlife are coming back. Now it's back to 70% frag again. There's my frustration with not having the right tool. Um, so we have a lot of challenges, whether we're cutting or using herbicides, whatever. Um, this is the big thing, like knowing this, your system where you're working so you don't do more harm than good. Uh, we're working in other species at risk, plants. So how do you deal with frag in these areas? Uh, other desirable plants that aren't species at risk, but they're very highly de uh, de desirable to have. The insects, pollinators are out there. Low high density cells. If you're using a herbicide, you're not just going to go broadcast spray everything. That's not responsible. So how do you deal with these different densities of Phragmites? For us, if, we, if the uh, only option is, is uh, using herbicide because the water's too shallow to drown, or it's not accessible or, or feasible to, to cut to drown, we don't have any option. Difficult terrain, how do you access these sites? The high winds, of course. Remote areas, how do you get, get to these areas and, and the densities? And of course, the timing for human use, too. You don't want to be out spraying or uh, doing this work when people are trying to recreate. So really site-specific approach. And uh, some of the sites, we're, we're dealing with it. And some sites, we can't. Uh, I just wanted to highlight there's a lot of projects going on in Ontario. We have an Ontario Phragmites Working Group. Uh, we meet every year and we share information. That's how uh, you know, we share about you know, this tool and, and lots of others that people are using that's working. Uh, so folks aren't trying to reinvent the wheel, um, learning from each other what's working, what's not working. And every year the, uh, we get more and more members, which is pretty exciting. Um, this, our last meeting we had uh, about 80 people show up in a snowstorm and another 53 call in. Our very first year that we started, we had nine people. So it's, uh, as frag spreads, our, our group gets bigger. There's some other uh, really important information that's come out as well, like the clean equipment protocol. It's trying to get contractors to clean their equipment. And a lot of municipalities are actually putting this in their, their tenders for contractors. Uh, parks are doing this as well. Any construction crews come to a park, it has to be cleaned. Um, we developed, some of our members developed a smart practices document because we were seeing uh, control work along roads being done that looked like it was just make work projects. Um, folks weren't doing it responsibly, so put uh, guiding documents together for them and for the agricultural community. Uh, the last thing I was going to talk about, we do have one project in Ontario that is using um, Roundup Custom. It started in 2016. This is an initiative from our provincial government, Ministry of Natural Resources, in partnership with Nature Conservancy of Canada, Ducks Unlimited Canada, Bird Studies Canada, Ontario Park, so a coalition in Long Point region. And uh, basically they had to go to our Health Canada, our federal government, and get a permit to bring this chemical in from the states. Um, and it's very specific areas that it's being used. Um, Long Point, Lake Erie, and Rondo Provincial Park, Lake Erie. Um, and there's a lot of monitoring going on with this project. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with these, this is Long Point, and, and this is Rondo Provincial Park here. And the reason that those sites were selected, uh, Long Point is the most biologically diverse system area in all of Ontario. Uh, lots of species at risk. Massive, massive uh, coastal wetlands there that still remain that aren't diked. And uh, frag is just a huge threat. Same with Rondo Provincial Park. So uh, the monitoring, um, I want to just highlight what's happening with the herbicide. Itself, because there's a lot of concern with using herbicides in, in wetland systems and natural systems. So basically, Rebecca Rooney, this is the University of Waterloo, looking at okay, once it's applied to, to Phragmites, how far does it go, migrate outside of the area that it's been sprayed on? How long does it last in the system? Um, is it impacting the aquatic biota? And so uh, I just want to just highlight just a little bit of her research. She can flush this out a lot more if, if you want to talk to her about this. But basically set up two transects. One was in an area where the frag maize was sprayed, either with ground or helicopter, and one was in an area that no treatment whatsoever took place and started in the frag maize, right in, right in the frag, right at the edge of the shoreline, and then out a gradient 100 meters out. And we collected water, set in samples, um, and they were analyzed for total suspended solids. 
Um, that was analyzed, and also the benthic invertebrates. We collected those as well for analysis. Um, so, uh, and we really, really uh, extensive research going on with this. And basically, bottom line is, uh, we went in just before they sprayed, within a 24-hour window after they sprayed, and then 30 days post. The highest concentrations were within that 24-hour window period, um, and they were at this one site here, and they were still far below the drinking water standards. Um, and certainly they were well below as well for uh, um, the Canadian guidelines uh, for um, impact on fresh water. So really the concentration is quite low and within the 30 days they, they, they drop below the, the baseline of detection. Same with, uh, I think the, the one time here for, for ex exceeded drinking water um, and, then, and then it dropped, but it was very, very close. Yeah. So that's the, that's the only areas in Ontario right now that we have herbicide use for, for over water. Um, I've been at this a long time, and it's kind of seen more areas where um, projects have started and then stopped because of funding, or um, people just get burned out or the interest switches to something else. But I've come, to came, I've come up with a kind of a, a guideline for how to deal with Phragmites because it's a very formidable plant, as you know. Big thing is, let's just get off the spread vectors. Like for me, roadside control is an easy fix. It's a lot easier to get it off of these systems than along a creek or in a pond or in a, in a wetland system. I know there's issues with it off of the, you know, the road allowance and it's going in the private property. I, I get that. But those are, to me, are easy, easy ways of, of controlling Phragmites. And, and promote the clean equipment protocol. It just stop spreading it around. Prioritize as well on the roads, if there's so much of it, let's, let's get rid of it where it's right near a creek or, or uh, a water course. Uh, in Ontario, we absolutely have to have this tool. There's absolutely no question about it. If we're going to uh, really deal with this plant responsibly, we need those tools. And we need the pu general public to understand that that pretty grass growing along the roads isn't native. They see it everywhere and they don't know. There's no education campaign out there. And this one here is the most important to me. There's a lot of people out there that are trying to deal with Phragmites, and they need support. They need um, support from local community governments and agencies to, to, to help them. But they're the ones that are going to keep it under control long term because they have a vested interest because it's in their, their neighborhood. And we also need dedicated funds. And I'm not talking like two years, three years. We need like a decade long pot of money that's there. When we start this project, we know it's there year to year. We have a game plan. We have money there, and we go. Because once you start, if you stop, you're wasting your money. You got, you're all in or you're not all in. You, you have to, it has to be one or the other. And so it has to take funding from all of the levels of government to make this work. And as I mentioned, it has to be locally driven. And, and basically, you have to have a management plan. OK, where is the frag? Whose property is it on? What partners do we have to bring to the table to discuss how we're going to deal with it? How are we going to prioritize? Like, what's our high priority areas? And then work from there. Um, and then long term, how are you going to keep it under control? Just don't walk away. Because guess what? It's going to come back. Particularly when you've got so much of it on the watershed. Yeah, but this is, this is the big one. Like, you can put your head down in the sand and say, OK, it's too much. You can't deal with it. But eventually, you're going to have to deal with it, because it's going to be a real problem. And you can't deal with it in isolation. So the quicker we deal with it, the, the better. I don't know if you have this. This is taken off. Highway 402, I've been watching it the last six years now. It's starting to move up some of the northern highways. This is actually a competing frag along some of the roads. This is going to be a real problematic plant. They're selling it in the nurseries. People love it. It's pretty grass. I think this is one to watch out for. Just saying. Anyway. <laughs>